ironic that in 2017, a year in which 4K gaming makes a big push with the Xbox One X, that one of the most popular titles is a throwback to the 1930s? A time before gaming even existed! Obviously I'm talking about Cuphead, a literal love letter to the earliest days of animation. But not only is it retro in its aesthetics, it's also retro in its difficulty. Cuphead comes at you hard and fast, testing the limits of your reflexes and skill from moment one. You could say it's the Crash Bandicoot of run and gun games, the dark souls of boss rush platformers. Cuphead is satisfying in a way that only the hardest video games can be. And it happens to be in a way that not a lot of game journalists will ever be able to experience. You see, recently VentureBeat published a video of one of their longtime journalists playing the game less than skillfully. And that video went viral, reigniting a debate that's been raging since the earliest days of gaming. Do video game journalists need to get good at video games? Do people speaking as experts in gaming need to play like experts as well? Of course they don't. Jeff, you're supposed to wait until I say the thing. Ah. Sorry, Matt, I'm just really excited to be here. Ladies and gentlemen of the internet, welcome to Deadlock. Matt, I am super sorry about coming on early in the intro. Well, and now you're starting the debate late because the camera's on. What? Oh, sorry. Seriously, Jeff, you gotta tone it down with that Canadian politeness, man. This is deadlock. It's gotta be snarky and mean. That's the whole shtick of the show. It's an online debate, man, for crying out loud. It's take no prisoners. Get brutal and vicious. Just like the brutal and vicious Canadians who made Cuphead. Or like the comments on your Undertale videos. Ooh, sorry. Okay, you gotta at least stop saying that. Absolutely! Just as soon as you stop making FNAF theories. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Jeff from the Anime Focus channel, Mother's Basement. Speaking of, Jeff, this is a gaming channel. Don't, shouldn't you be off hugging a body pillow of your waifu? I can do both. Besides, I've actually got a lot of experience in this field. Before I analyzed anime for a living, I wrote for several different video game websites, including one where I was the features editor. And I went to school for game design, which I think makes me a little more qualified to talk about this than you are, buddy. I mean, your neuroscience degree is impressive and all, but games aren't exactly brain surgery. <laughs> okay, tell that to Dean Takahashi, the journalist who made that Cuphead video. It takes him nearly a minute and 30 seconds to get a dash jump. In the tutorial, the channel X Stick Figure X had his five-year-old play the game and did a side-by-side -side comparison of the two gameplay videos. The same jump took the five-year-old kid seven seconds. Nobody who plays games for a living should play that poorly. It is painful to watch. It is, and you're right. Wait, I am? These usually go on for like 10 minutes at least. Sorry. Sorry, Matt. You're right that nobody who plays games for a living should play that poorly, but game journalists don't play games for a living. They write about games for a living. And writing is the single most important skill that they can have. I mean, I can ghost all of the levels in Hitman Blood Money on the hardest difficulty, but that's not gonna fill my writing portfolio and it's not gonna get me a job. The same goes for YouTube and Twitch. Even Let's Players and live streamers whose job is literally to play video games draw in their audiences with personality and production values, not with their hardcore skills. Look at how many fail compilations there are for the Game Grumps or PewDiePie or the Super Best Friends. And everybody loves those guys. I mean, why do you think so many people watch GT Live? Are they there to see you S-rank all of the bosses in Cuphead? Or are they drawn in by your winning personality? Huh, flattery isn't gonna help you win this debate, Jeff. Eh, it was worth a shot. The point is that game journalists, like everybody else in the gaming media, are just that, media. They are entertainers. All they need to do is write entertaining and informative articles. That's the key word there, though. Informative. 
I mean, obviously playing games is only part of a game journalist's job, but it is still part of it. And you can't write anything informative about a game if you yourself aren't informed about how it works. There are subtle nuances to games, like how they feel when you play, that you can only understand by, you know, playing a bunch of games. You wouldn't trust a review of a book from someone who can't read half the words. So why should we trust a review for a game from someone who can't do something as basic as pass the tutorial? That is like the bare minimum we should be expecting of these game journalists. Otherwise, everything just becomes the dark souls of its genre. Okay, Matt, you're talking a lot about reviews, but that's actually a very small part of what game journalists do. Most writers, before they ever get a chance to write a review or editorial, get their start writing news pieces based on press releases. And for that job, all you really need is an ability to turn in readable work quickly and with few errors for your editor to correct. And for bigger pieces like Dean Takahashi's expose about the Xbox 360's Red Ring of Death problem, the most important thing to have is sources within the industry who can give you reliable information and an ability to write to keep people engaged for a long period of time. Sure, I'll concede that not every article written on a gaming news site requires an author who can actually play games. It's the same thing with writing theories, actually. You have to be great at research and telling a story first and foremost, but there are articles that gaming websites publish, like reviews or previews or guides, that need to be written by someone who is able to pick up, understand, and beat games. If they can't do that, we as the audience can't trust what they have to say about those games, especially if your job is boiling a game down to a single number for a review. For example, you need to play a lot of platformers to get a feel for little things, like whether a game's controls are precise or loose and floaty, and also the big things, like whether or not the difficulty in the game is even fair. An experienced player and a total noob will probably be equally frustrated with a level like, say, Crash Bandicoot's High Road. But the professional will understand that it's because of cheap trial and error game design and Crash's new hitbox in the remaster rather than their own inability as a gamer. Ah, now who's making excuses? Uh, sure, it took me a while, but I fully completed all those new Crash games. And that's the point here. This isn't just about one specific game or one bad play session, it's about overall experience. Journalists may not need to be pro, but they do need to be proficient. When I was in theater, I was expected to sight read music, get handed a sheet of music, and do a decent job of singing it on the spot based on my knowledge of intervals and patterns. The same thing applies to gaming. It's actually my proudest skill as a gamer. Not that I can speed run one game in world record time, but that there are certain genres of games that you can throw me into, like rhythm games or platformers, and I can burn through them really quickly on a first playthrough, sight reading the game just based on my experience as a gamer. It's proficiency. And if you look at Venture Beat's Cup video or the infamous Polygon Plays Doom, you just don't see that coming out of the game journalist. You're right. Genre-specific experience is important for writing reviews and previews, but the key word there is genre. Games require lots of different skill sets, and nobody's going to be good at every single one. I mean, Daigo Umehara is the best Street Fighter player in the world, but you wouldn't expect him to dominate at Overwatch the very first time he picks it up. And the same goes for game journalists. I mean, I'm great at RPGs, puzzlers, stealth games, and platformers, but put a rhythm game or an RTS in front of me and I'm hopeless. Everybody has different areas of expertise. Absolutely! And I'm not saying that hardcore FPS guys should be reviewing Mario Odyssey, but what I am saying is that writers should be matched up with the games that fit their knowledge set. I remember this old Nintendo Power review of Azuna the Unemployed Ninja, where the reviewer spent the entire article complaining that the random levels and loss of progress on death were unfair. Basically, he was just complaining about the fact that the game was a roguelike. That's not useful for anyone, especially for people who know and enjoy roguelikes. In a perfect world, yeah, every game would be assigned to an expert in its genre. But in the real world, you often have to make compromises. Game previews happen at events like conventions. I mean, that Cuphead footage came all the way from Gamescom in Germany and it's expensive to send reporters to events like that, especially if they're on a different continent from your publication. Game site traffic mainly comes from exclusive coverage of big, high-profile game releases, so 
you really can't afford to have any of the reporters that you have in an event like that not cover all of the big games. And timeliness is also a huge factor here. Reviews are often written on strict deadlines, needing to come out the same day a game is released or a few days before. So it's even more important that a writer be able to write quickly and write well than it is for them to be great at a game or even finish it sometime. Wolfenstein 2, just this month, came out seven days before Call of Duty World War II and three days after Destiny 2 hit PC. If your site only has one first-person shooter guy, then you're gonna have to kick it down the line to your RPG guy who barely plays shooters at all to pick up the slack. Because at the end of the day, you can't afford to miss any of those if you're a serious gaming website. For big ticket games, a review or preview from a writer who might not be that experienced with the game is a lot better for business than one that comes late or doesn't come at all. <laughs> is it? Is it, Jeff? For whose business is it better? Is it better for the site? Sure, they may get a few extra clicks off a popular game title, but once I'm on that article, their integrity is getting thrown out the window as they showcase how unprepared they are to do real coverage of the game. In essence, they're choosing to get a few cheap clicks in the near term while sacrificing the opportunity to build trust with the reader by showing that they do good work, encouraging that reader to be a part of their community and becoming a loyal source of clicks for sometimes years to come. People wonder why gamers on YouTube are skeptical of gaming news outlets. This is why. Quantity of coverage over quality of coverage, thus making them unreliable and, as a result, these sites are hemorrhaging readership. Or, wait Jeff, maybe you mean it's better for the reader's business, who gets a hastily slapped together preview written by someone without the chops to deliver the information I, as a fan of the genre, care about. That's just gonna leave me looking for coverage elsewhere. Or worse, it's showcasing the game poorly, reducing my excitement for something I may have been interested in. Hey. Or maybe, Jeff, you mean it's good for the game developers themselves, but I don't know how. When writing a game preview or review, a journalist's job is to inform readers' purchases first and foremost. In reviews, they are literally boiling down an entire game experience into one number. If writers are delivering lackluster or coverage of the game in their previews, or don't have the experience necessary to review the game accurately relative to other games, they're misrepresenting that game, and in the process risking not only my money as the consumer, but the millions upon millions of dollars of investment that game makers have put into actually producing the thing in the first place. Activision's vice president of marketing has gone so far as to say that, quote, for every additional five points over an 80% average review score, Sales may as much double for that game. Well, Matt, you know what they say. All publicity is good publicity. And the developers who can afford to spend tens of millions of dollars making and marketing their games aren't the only ones we need to worry about. Sure, you might lose a bit of depth of coverage overall if a reviewer can't spend the 100 hours that it takes to finish a game like Final Fantasy XII, but the flip side of that is that that reviewer will be able to cover many more games much more quickly, which is increasingly important in a world where more and more games are coming out every single week. What would you rather see, Matt? A review from a guy who spent 35 hours collecting 834 Power Moons in Super Mario Odyssey, or a review from a guy who spent 10 hours on Mario, and then 30 hours playing a bunch of different indie games that would have never gotten any coverage otherwise. The way that the industry works right now certainly isn't perfect, but when the alternative is hiring on a bunch of different underskilled writers who mainly get paid in exposure and free video games, or letting indie games languish in obscurity because the skilled writers you have on staff aren't qualified to play that particular genre, I think that the way things work right now is the best possible solution, at least what we have currently, for the overall health of the industry. Honestly, I have to disagree. I think the best thing for the health of the industry has been sites like YouTube and Twitch. They've created a system where you get to know the gamer, their likes and their dislikes, so that when they actually say they're excited about a game, you can believe it. They are really excited about that game. And online gamers are less dependent on advertising dollars directly paid to them by the gaming companies. 
Traditional websites rely on selling ad space directly to those companies, so making sure AAA games get good reviews is imperative. Sure, those relationships still exist on YouTube via paid sponsorships, but those sponsorships have to be disclosed. And YouTube is the one selling the ad space to all sorts of different companies, so if I say that I don't like a certain game, it doesn't mean I'm gonna go bankrupt when they suddenly pull out their ad dollars on me. Long story short, game journalists aren't just representatives of the industry. They have to represent the players as well. And as such, they need to at least be good enough to give the games they cover a fair shot. There's a lot of money on the line if they're not up to that task. And hundreds, if not thousands of gamers might be misled into missing out on a game that they would absolutely love simply based on a bad review or a bad preview. Game journalists can't just play games for the sake of their own enjoyment. They have a job to do, and they have to do that job well. They absolutely do. But there's a lot more to that job than just twitch reflexes and high scores. And getting those things right needs to come first. Ladies and gentlemen of the internet, we have reached deadlock. Now the decision is in your hands. Do reviewers need to get good, or does control over the English language top control over a controller. Click the eye icon in the upper right hand corner of the screen to cast your vote. Last time in the battle of whether Crash Bandicoot is overrated, 200,000 people voted and 60% said no. Crash Bandicoot is good, no matter how many cheap deaths you might have on the high road.